Hi Bozeman, my name is Miles McGeehan and uh, I'm a science teacher at the high school. I'm currently assigned to teaching AP Biology and Chemistry. I've been in the district for about nine years now and uh, I've been teaching for a number of years before moving to Montana. Um, and I, I wanted to take a moment to share uh, I guess some of my um, experiences using an LMS that I, I, I want to pass on that maybe will help save you some time with organization and uh, basic ways of kind of communicating and building a calendar and that kind of stuff with students. Um, I've been using an LMS uh, for many, many years in my classes. Uh, different districts have had access to LMSs before moving to uh, Montana. And uh, I can, you know, I guess uh, w warmly say that I'm a better teacher with an LMS. Um, and what it does for me in the classroom is uh, in a normal year without a pandemic is it allows me to kind of make a, a digital file cabinet of our resources so it saves me time next year when I go back to finding a YouTube video I used before or uh, some digital assignment you know I can embed a Google Doc into it or whatever and it just keeps it all in one place but it, it also aside from organization uh, provides so many other tools that helps kind of augment uh, what's going on in my classroom. It's kind of like having a new set of crayons or a new set of uh, markers or you know you name it. Um, new equipment in my science class uh, that's used in the labs. Um, so it's it's a, a new tool and uh, there are things that that can really help enhance uh, certain activities. Um, I still feel that paper and pencil assignments, uh, and I still use plenty of paper pencil assignments in my classroom, so an LMS doesn't take over my classroom, but it, it is a great resource from time to time. Um, and in the situation we're in, it's the best resource for um, connecting with students, whether they're in your classroom and we're helping them learn to navigate the LMS, or whether they're uh, at home or in a pod or at a uh, child care facility or whatever, um, we're communicating some of the resources and the classroom lessons and the activities to maybe an adult that's helping assist our students um, keep up with the work that um, that is so important. So without further ado, um, I'd like to share a few things that I've learned over the years uh, about just getting started, you know, how to kind of organize your content, and uh, how, to, how to build a template to save you time so that you can kind of get a rhythm going. What I do want to emphasize is that I'm just volunteering this information. It's by no means like the doctrine of how to organize your content. I hope that some of the ideas I share would be useful in your PLC conversations or grade level teams or uh, department teams and so forth depending on the grade band and the school setting that you work at. So maybe use some of these ideas as a way of getting the ball rolling and, and run with them. Um, I remember my first year teaching in the way that I wrote on my chalkboard, I'm dating myself, I actually had a chalkboard um, before the whiteboard, <clears throat> but the way that I organized information on my chalkboard in the first day, the first week of class, in my first year teaching, that pattern how I wrote on the chalkboard changed by the third week and by the end of the year in my first year. The way that I um, organized things like objectives or um, where the homework was due and so forth um, changed over time. And I think you're going to find the same. Some of the ideas I might give you here could be useful to help you get the ball rolling, but ultimately, you know, this LMS, the name Canvas is, I think, indicative of what you're working with. You're working with a blank canvas, and how you start off in the first week might look a little different by the third week as you start to get more used to the tools and the way that you communicate with your students. I, my biggest suggestion would be listen to the students, and if they're um, expressing some struggles or the parents are expressing some struggles ask them like use a survey or, or a brief interview and, and figure out like what was their hang-up and by listening and kind of following that um, 
that reflective design process uh, in practicing and doing, uh, you'll, you'll find your rhythm and you'll get going. And, and, and uh, before long, you're going to really start to um, you know, pick up steam with this. So I would also you know, start the year off by telling students, so like, hey, this is a really cool tool and we're going to be experimenting together. So I'd like you to share with me at any time if you're feeling um, confused. And I'm going to learn and make adaptations as we go. And what I'm doing in the first week might look different by the third week and by the fifth week and by Christmas time and spring break and so forth. So I, I think if, we're, if we are communicative in the beginning, that uh, things will be flexible and uh, that this is a growth mindset for all, um, it, it will set up the students to be our advocates as well. All right, so I'm going to jump into some thinking um, and I'm going to be thinking out loud for a little while with this video about how I start to adapt my AP, <clears throat> excuse me, AP Biology course uh, into the LMS um, workflow. Here we go. All right, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, <clears throat> how am I going to start the year? Well, in AP Bio, uh, I'm going to pare this down, but Imagine I have uh, these four major units I cover throughout the year. And so I'm going to start thinking about each unit as a module in Canvas. I know what you're thinking, though. Like, maybe you're a new teacher. Maybe you're a teacher that's just changed to a new grade level, and you're not sure what all the different units are throughout the year. Fear not. Let's just pick one to start with. So I'm going to start with Ecology. Next, I'm thinking within ecology, are there some you know, subgroups or themes? And so in ecology, I break it down into population dynamics followed by predator-prey relationships and then trophic cascades. Let's see how that looks uh, within how I can organize that in Canvas in the LMS. Okay, here I'm in my modules page and um, I've got ecology, evolution, cell biology, genetics, and again, this is a little bit pared down. Um, I do a little bit more with AP Biology, but I just want to make some examples here. And in ecology, if I click here, I can set up, I've got three headers. So on that whiteboard diagram, I had population dynamics, predator-prey relationships, and trophic level cascades. So uh, these headers, you can create those in your module. When you hit the plus button, if you select the text header, uh, you can create those kind of uh, those little bands. Now within the text header, I'm going to start populating with uh, the different lessons that uh, under that go under population dynamics. So my first one is called population dynamics one, theoretical. Now bear with me. This is college biology, so there, you're going to see some stuff that's a little heady. But uh, nonetheless, I want to show you just the lesson flow and how to make a template so that you can just copy and paste the template when you design the next lesson so that it's easier to fill in and that you're not just uh, spending time over and over retyping the same things with each activity. So within my topic, now notice I name it a topic and that's important. Later I'll mention why I call it a topic so I can reference it in the calendar or in the week at a glance. I like to start with a, a hook, objective, something like engage, explore, and then like a task or the way I evaluate student learning or they can evaluate themselves, self-evaluation. And uh, I certainly invite you to stray from the words I've put here, choose what works for you, and uh, maybe have a conversation in your PLC, have a conversation in your um, teams at the middle school or in your departments and I, I'll tell you that it's not the same what I put in my AP biology class these words change from what I put in my chemistry class I work with different populations of students and so there's no right or wrong here I would say uh, refer back to kind of your your gut instincts and best practices and the way you communicate on the whiteboard and think critically about how you present to students. Now I know that a lot of us present the hook or the why to our students when we're in a face-to-face -face classroom through verbal interactions, through short little video clips, 
through um, cool demonstrations. Like we make it very vivid to students like why this is important. And the this space here shouldn't go underlooked because when they're in distance learning, if they're not with you, I think it's important to help make it clear why. And so that could be like an essential question. Um, it could be, well, I'll pause for a second. I'll, I'll show you the template and then it has some prompts to get your creative juices going. Anyways, as we move down a little bit, I like to use the uh, objective statement and then move into embedding some media, maybe some textbook pages, and then um, some type of task. So <clears throat> in this particular task, I'm using a page, a page setup in uh, Canvas, and I'm not asking them to turn anything in. I'm giving them uh, some practice problems. There was a little tutorial with this, and then they have an answer key so they can self-assess. And then I would uh, discuss with them in other means that they, if they struggle with those practice problems, they can reach out to me. We can uh, do a Google Meet. We can do office hours and so forth. <clears throat> but a lot of times, if you give them some type of like solutions, and remember, maybe it's an adult that's helping them through this in the first weeks or two. If if they have an answer key, um, it will go a long way in in helping students self-assess uh, where they are and where they are not. And, uh, and then the questions they might ask you in a Google Meet uh, are oftentimes a lot more clear. Uh, they can point to a particular question, and they can ask for clarification, and, and so forth. All right, let's get to how I make a template. So I'm going to go to the Pages area, and I've got this template with some descriptions. And so I'll pause on the screen here for a minute. You can read out loud. You can pause your own video and keep reading these, but I think it is important that as teachers, we are able to craft a very object, a clear objective statement to students, whether it's an I can or students will be able to and refer to using your Bloom's taxonomy words uh, to clearly identify what their objective is. And I love some of the modules we've been working through uh, in Canvas that talk about criteria for success. Uh, I oftentimes embed those uh, terms like criteria for success into my assignment directions uh, or I have them on my whiteboard if I'm in a face-to-face -face setting. So I might adapt this. You know, I'm learning Canvas uh, with you too and, and so I might adapt this template and uh, I by no means say that this template is what you should do. You should um, have a discussion and uh, but but maybe if you think about what a template might look like here's how it could work you can simply when you build a template copy it so I'm highlighting it I'm going to use some quick keys on my keyboard command C to copy it and then when I want to make a new page I can select the plus page button and then paste the template in I name the template a one in front of the template. So if I surf through these different pages here, if I put a one in front, the template will always be at the top of like the alphanumeric list. So here's the template without descriptions. It's a little bit more basic. The hook, objective, engage, and here I put media and textbook and so forth. And then, all right, so another way other than copy and paste I could come over here to the little dot 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 and choose to duplicate. And so here it shows up as a duplicate copy and now I can choose to edit. And so I'm going to call this population dynamics lesson two. And this one is more realistic. What doesn't happen in theory, what happens in nature. And now I'm going to start modifying this uh, for my new lesson. So I'm going to edit. And let me show you how I populate. You know, I can write the, I, or the, um, the question, like the essential question, or have some kind of cool cartoon up here or something. I can do my I can statement. Now, imagine I want to embed a YouTube video. And I know we've seen this uh, 
on our module, learning modules and so forth. Uh, I'm going to choose the, here it is, the insert edit media. And it's going to ask me the source. So I've got the YouTube video I want to in include for students to peruse up here. And I'm going to just hit the share button. And I'm going to just copy this or choose this copy button. And come back to my canvas and paste it in. I know I'm going quick, so you can rewind and watch it again. Here's the thing. It says dimensions 560. That's actually going to be really large. Um, I don't like it that large. So I like it to go around more like 250, and it's going to constrain the proportions. So you're going to notice the numbers are going to adjust automatically, and it fits in a little smaller. And I train my students that I don't want them to watch this little itty-bitty video, but if they hit play, they can click here and watch it on YouTube, or they can click here and watch it full screen. And so that's how I train my students how to interact with that little video clip. FYI, mess around with the numbers you like. Maybe 250 is a little bit too big, too small. Um, explore. All right, so if I hit save, then I'm good to go. Or maybe I need to hit save and publish. There are some tips for you how to make a template. Next up, I'm going to go back to my modules. And uh, I can add that most recent one. I, I wasn't fully done with it yet, but here it is. Add the item. And oh, it's populated down here, so I'm going to slide it up. And I want to indent it, so I'll come over to the little dot, dot, dot. Get it to the kind of same indention. Boy, I really like to have the word topic in there. I don't like that I forgot the right topic here, so I'm going to just quickly edit. Scroll to the end and write topic. Good to go. I find there's value in keeping redundancy in how you name things for students. And then you'll use those same names within like a week at a glance or a calendar uh, and so forth. It's also helpful for maybe a parent or guardian that's helping the students navigate in their first weeks. All right, I'm gonna um, go through one more now these are both pages. You can see the little icon here represents their pages. These are like one-way streets. I use a page to just get information out. Maybe there's a formative task at the end, but I didn't actually collect the work from the students to put into the gradebook. Now I'm gonna use an assignment when I wanna collect work from the students. So I'm gonna uh, kinda speed up the motion of building this assignment called the Rabbit's Grass Weeds Assignment where they are gonna use um, a, a virtual simulation and they're going to follow directions that I've presented to them through a PDF document. And when they're done uh, with the simulation, when they, they're going to present what they learned by following the directions in the document. And they're going to make a single Google slide as their artifact of understanding. And then I'm going to ask them to upload that back. And then I'm going to provide a grade to them. So here's how it works. I'm going to open up. And I, I've already copied and pasted in. Um, my template so it looks the same you know I went to the pages button and I copy and pasted it here and now I'm going to start editing it and I'm going to speed it up uh, really rapidly so you can see how I work through this All right, next I want to embed a PDF document that's actually in my Google Drive. <clears throat> so this is called the Rabbits, Grass, Weeds, Lab Directions. And I'm going to simply highlight this term and uh, select the Google Drive. Now I know what you're thinking, it's not the bison poop video. It's this one here, so I'm gonna link it. And the uh, neat thing that Canvas does is it took the terms I had here and, uh, and just hyperlinked it. So you saw that little yellow blur and then now it's a blue hyperlink. Pretty cool. In the directions, it's gonna prompt them to go to a particular website. And so I'm gonna call that the rabbit's grass weeds population website. 
and uh, I've got the tab open here and uh, with the tab open I'm going to just highlight over everything so get the whole area and I'm going to use my quick keys command C to copy that come back to my tab with canvas and uh, highlight over these words here and come up and this little chain link very commonly used in a lot of other uh, you'll, you'll even find it like Microsoft or Google um, rich text editors so that's a link to a website URL and uh, I'm gonna paste it in and so here I'm using the quick keys command V to paste insert the link and you see the little yellow blur and voila now there's a link for the students um, directions here website here and that's my engage and explore at the high school level we have students maybe fully uh, in the distance mode and uh, we're gonna have to do a little more to educate them on um, this lesson flow this is a very basic parsing uh, with my face-to-face -face kids I'll be able to provide them some explanations in the first week or two of school of here's how you navigate when you find a blue hyperlink go ahead and click on it and and so forth so I'm gonna keep this pretty simple for now um, but do know that I might need to provide uh, extra front loading with my students and modeling and using canvas real-time in the classroom so get the devices out and let's navigate and practice doing one of these together and and uh, and you know build that efficacy just like we do if the student goes to a soccer practice or a basketball practice and so forth we start with small drills and skills and we level them up with time um, and, and so forth so I'll leave it at that task evaluate so here um, in a simple world in a face-to-face -face classrooms I'm going to include some directions and my directions are that they're going to build a simple one slide Google slide uh, demonstrating their understanding and the layout for the Google slides is actually in the directions worksheet so it actually provided a little template uh, icon of what they needed to include so I don't need to go into an elaborate uh, set of directions here other than uh, I'm going to say something like please upload your completed Google slide here and I'm going to uh, just keep it as uh, as simple as that for right now for this demonstration. Notice as you go down below, this is an assignment, so I can choose how many points. Maybe it's a four, three, two, one. Maybe it's ten points. Maybe it's fifty points. I don't know what your your grade expertise does, so I'll leave it as ten. Um, I can choose what they can upload. We saw in some of the practice modules this last week that. You can do a text entry, or or maybe it's just a simple file. I want them to upload the Google slide, so I'm going to just simply choose file upload. But notice you can choose more than one if you want. I'm going to keep it to this is the only thing they can upload to me. Unlimited attempts, yes. Don't put just one because if they make a mistake, they can do it a second time, and you can grade the most recent. That's the easiest way to go about it. All these other things are for you to explore. At, um, at when you're ready to start adding due dates and, and uh, times when the assignment's visible and not visible and so forth. But you can leave them blank for now and it still all works just fine. So here's my assignment, it's worth 10 points. I'm gonna go back to my modules page and let's add that assignment. So here we go, add assignment. There's my grass weeds assignment. And I'm going to slide it on up and slide it on over. All right, so I hope this provides a little scaffolding for how you might start organizing modules, things like pages, which I consider like one-way streets of information, assignments, which are like two-way streets where you present information and they turn something back into you. I think it's important to take a moment and share what I would not do. And after having about 20 years of experience building LMSs, I've learned the hard way along the line that you should not build, well, I shouldn't say you should not, but I caution you to build an LMS module by week. Um, it may be appropriate for some really young learners, but the problem with building by week is that it's very difficult to reuse 
the stuff you built in the following year because we inevitably start on a different day on the calendar. We start on a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Tuesday. And then as the year progresses, there are disruptions in our dynamic calendar setting. Like there's a fire drill, um, or we have an assembly, or um, there's a black bear on the playground, and we have to modify our school schedule as a result. So if you organize all your content week by week, do know that it makes it challenging next year. It'll still be there, but you will have to do a lot of reorganization. I've learned that naming things topics works really well because then you can identify it on your um, at-a-glance sheet or identify it on your calendar. Uh, and, and if you have A group students attending certain days and B group students attending certain days, I know it's going to be a little tough for this first month, uh, but you can you can identify uh, with different groups of students what tasks, what topics they could be working on um, when they're distance or when they're with you face to face. So, um, I, my best suggestion is you may change your mind in a few weeks. It's fine, um, but. I think naming things an individual topic, which would be like a 50 minute activity or a 30 minute activity in your classroom, uh, is really a good way to, to be able to reuse it again next year. Uh, and uh, sometimes a topic takes me more than one day. In, in the high school setting, we have 50 minute class periods. And, and so sometimes I work on a topic for two or three days, uh, which is okay too. Um, and I would, just prescribe those directions in my calendar or my week at a glance with students like what a good starting and stopping point is in a particular topic. So I hope that's good advice. Um, what not to do. Um, think about it more as thematic units and individual topics as opposed to uh, individual weeks or naming things like day one lesson, day two lesson, day three lesson because inevitably you're going to come up with something different next year. And then you have to rename everything. So, all right, well, <clears throat> I'll leave it at that. Um, let's get on to uh, one other quick suggestion I have, and that's uh, with the calendar. I'm going to pause here and uh, highlight how I might use the calendar tool. In a normal face to face setting, in a normal world, I use the calendar tool all the time. With blended learning, seeing two days a week students in, in my classroom and three days a week out and so forth, I haven't quite figured out that calendar tool just yet, but hopefully we make it back to like five days a week with students and here's how the calendar tool might work for you. If we end up in a total distance learning, it would work the same way. So on the calendar tool, same thing, I make a template. So I can make a template with like a generic calendar date back like in August where the kids don't see and just simply copy and paste it. So in my calendar, I like to do something like what's due before the start of class. That, this is for high school students, so you might modify that for elementary or middle school. The objective, and that's just what I put into the lesson flow. So I can copy and paste that objective here. No extra work necessary, just a quick little uh, nugget. Agenda. And uh, here's uh, kind of a step one, step two, what we would do in my normal face-to-face -face class in a normal year or what they might have to do in an order of a distance learning event and then any homework. And so if you hit the edit tool and you choose more options, you get that rich text editor where you can uh, put in different items. Again, I like to make a template and uh, I like to use color a lot to really highlight for the students. And then, you know, it has a bullet list or the numeric list and so forth. So do explore the calendar. It can be an awesome tool. And once you build a calendar for a particular topic in your class, you know, so notice I named the topic right here. And maybe you choose like uh, some color coding for the students and use the same kind of color coding every time. <clears throat> um, next year, you can just copy and paste the calendar entry again. And so you don't have to recreate the calendar year after year after year. Um, so the calendar I find is an awesome tool uh, 
All right, I'll get off my soapbox there. I hope you find some of these items such as building templates and reusing those same kind of lesson flow templates um, advantageous in the first, first weeks of, you, of your exploration of LMSs. And uh, by all means, uh, this is just a voluntary suggestion of ideas, so don't please take it as a doctrine. Please explore how it works for you and uh, have a lot of fun with it. Um, listen to your students, listen to your families, um, invite constructive feedback and uh, ask your peers too like do you understand if I presented this to the students would you be able to follow this so maybe do a test drive with a uh, with a colleague in a passing period or during a prep period and see if your colleague would uh, be able to make sense of it like a third grader an eighth grader or a twelfth grader could well thanks for listening be safe be well see you on the other side of this have a great day Bozeman Remember, keep it classy.